Patrick Christopher Pindle was born in Nassau on November 1, 1953, and baptized on December 13 at St. Francis Xavier Cathedral. He was ordained priest on August 15, 1980, appointed auxiliary bishop on June 27, 2003. He was ordained bishop at Loyola Hall, Nassau, on August 15, 2003, the 23rd anniversary of his priesthood. He was appointed Metropolitan Archbishop of Nassau on February 17, 2004, and installed May 4th at St. Francis Xavier Cathedral. On this day, two decades ago, on August 15, 2003, God blessed the Archdiocese of Nassau with the installation of our first ever Bahamian Archbishop. His Holiness Pope John Paul II named a native son, Patrick Christopher Pinda, to lead, teach, and serve the faithful of our local Roman Catholic community. 20 years later, our shepherd shares his reflections. Reflecting on that historic day, Archbishop Pinda says he didn't see the appointment as an achievement for himself, but as an important landmark in the history of the Catholic community in the Bahamas. Well, you know, I suppose the day itself had, had a fairly large shadow cast before it because the announcement itself had been made some time before, and of course a lot of planning had to go into preparing for the actual day of the ordination itself. In a sense, um, it's kind of hard to really capture all the, the full complement of emotions uh, surrounding the day. Um, I, I would say this, though, that it, I didn't see it so much as an achievement for myself as it was, I believe, an important landmark in the history of the Catholic community here in the Bahamas. As you know, um, we've been, uh, we, the Baham Nassau had been a diocese since 1960, and it had been an archdiocese since 1999. But all that time, we've, we've always had, uh, as it were, missionary bishops, bishops from abroad who came to give leadership, and for which we are very, very grateful. But the moment uh, when we had a, an indigenous bishop, I think it was a time when certainly the hearts of so many of our Catholic people and, and those beyond the Catholic community as well were certainly very, very uh, gratified that at this point we've had such an important achievement in the life of the church here in the Bahamas. Archbishop grew up in the era when our diocese was dependent on foreign religious orders. Asked if as a young Patrick he ever imagined that one day he would be ordained the first Bahamian Archbishop. Here is his response. Quite frankly, the answer to that question is no. By no means do I consider myself to have had any kind of, uh, uh, shall we say, entitlement to be bishop, by no means. In fact, um, I recall uh, my immediate predecessor, Archbishop Burke, had asked us all to pray that we have uh, a bishop appointed to succeed him. And I remember praying ardently for that, never at all thinking that actually I'd end up being the one to, to, to in fact, succeed him. But no, I think that uh, I, I never ever gave any thought to, to, being, uh, to being the bishop. I always wanted to be a good priest. And I trust that I brought that intention uh, and, and, and that will, that desire, by God's grace, to the office of bishop as well. The title, um, bishop, first of all, you know, a bishop is a successor to the apostles in our tradition. A bishop is a successor to the apostles. And so, uh, what, the really, what the title really refers to is, uh, is first and for foremost, our link to the most solid and fundamental tradition of uh, the Christian faith. Secondly, I think it's important to bear in mind that the bishop really is, as it were, the, the primary teacher of the faith. He's also the one who has to give the primary example of living the faith. And so in a sense, the bishop really is the first of the servants of the faith in the community. And I think it's important to bear that in mind. One comes to the office of bishop not to be served, but to serve, and to do so in a manner that's exemplary, that actually reflects um, the life of Christ the Good Shepherd by his manner of both courage and compassion. Really, in, in a very, very real sense, the bishop has to be an image, an icon of Christ. August 15, 2003, also marks another significant milestone for the Archbishop. He celebrates 43 years as a priest. First of all, you have to bear in mind that in order to understand it properly, a vocation to the priesthood is a grace, it's a gift. 
it's a, it's a call, a call to which you must uh, respond, and even the response itself has to be done in grace. So uh, basically, the, the, uh, what inspired me, I think that um, there are many, many uh, streams of inspiration that led to my potentially wanting to be uh, a priest, wanting to consider responding to the, to the call to the priesthood. And perhaps the first uh, one would have begun in our home, in our family, with, with my maternal grandmother, who was the first Catholic in, in my family. Uh, she she uh, encountered the Catholic faith as a young uh, teenager in Mangrove Fiandros. She became a Catholic as a young teenager, and she remained faithful to the faith all her life. I think her example had a profound impact on me. Also along the way now, bear in mind that there are others too. I, I think particularly of the sisters who were the ones who taught us um, in school. At the time, there were uh, Sisters of Charity out of New York. They made a wonderful impression um, on us, and also the various priests throughout the ages as well. I think uh, all, those, all those streams of influences came to bear. And I suppose one can, cannot overlook the example of um, uh, good lay people as well, who were exemplary members of uh, our community, who by their example, and sometimes a quiet and spoken example, uh, encouraged me to be a priest and to respond to the vocation of the priesthood. During the past 20 years, one of Archbishop's focus was to refurbish existing worship spaces and, where necessary, build new structures to ensure that the parish and school infrastructures were appropriate to the needs of the community. I became the ordinary in 2005, I was ordained a bishop in 2003, but um, from August 15th of 2003 until May the, the 4th of 2004, I in fact was the auxiliary bishop of Nassau. I became the archbishop in 2004. And uh, um, basically much of what I have done followed upon many of the projects that were in place um, before I became bishop, and for which I was quite familiar, because with which I was quite familiar, because I had been first a moderator of the Curia, and then eventually the, the, the vicar general of the archdiocese before becoming auxiliary bishop. So a number of things that I actually undertook really were a natural progression of what had been in place prior to my becoming bishop. So the largest project was, was the relocation of Aquinas College. That was a monumental task. And um, it was one that was that kind of fell squarely in my in my lap. The new cathedral had just been completed. We still had to com com complete the payments for it, but the structure itself was finished. We had to do the relocation of Aquinas, and then we had to uh, build a number of, of uh, restore a number of the local parishes here in New Providence, and in the family islands. Uh, this sort of thing, I think, is required uh, as an expression of the vibrance of the life of the church, and also I think it's important for people to realize that uh, when we gather to worship, we should do so in a space that's uh, adequately and properly appointed for that purpose. And so uh, I think it's important for us to actually um, bear that in mind. The church really has both a cultic and a civic function. Its cultic function, as you know, basically is for the regular worship, uh, both in good times and in bad and in ordinary times. So your weekly masses, your Sunday masses, your weddings, your funerals, and whatever else. That's the cultic function of the church and its primary function, perhaps. There's also a civic function. The church is uh, really um, uh, uh, rather solid, substantial um, physical structures, which are perhaps uh, most useful when, in times of uh, disaster or tragedy. We saw that, for example, in a place like Abaco during Hurricane Dorian, where our church up there in Marsh Harbor became a shelter, impromptu shelter for people for weeks before they were actually properly provided for in shelters here in New Providence. The, the, um, I don't think pride really uh, comes to play. I think that uh, a sense of uh, satisfaction, um, as far as I'm concerned, is with regards to all the projects I did, all the projects I, I actually led uh, the, the completion of, because I didn't do any one thing by myself. I think many of those things, all of them were, were team projects, and those who worked on the teams along with me were uh, uh, certainly um, uh, do um, uh, praise and recognition as well. But um, I, I would say that I feel satisfied with regards to all the projects we undertook. Um, well, they're related. I think the most, uh, the most uh, fundamental problem we, we have really is connected to family life. 
and uh, the quality of family life, and that impacts everything. It impacts uh, the way our kids are socialized and uh, also the way in which people feel a sense of normalcy in carrying on their everyday lives. If, if a sense of family isn't strong and solid and well settled, it's going to impact everything else. It will have ripple effects across the entire community. That impacts also vocations. Good vocations come from good family life. If you don't have really uh, a real solid fabric of good family life, it will definitely impact vocations. The two go together, there's no question about it. In our, our community of faith has to be engaged in the life of the community as a whole. And in so many areas, we have to not only act, but also act with a certain sense of leadership. You mentioned a couple of things there. One in particular is a whole question of the so-called marital rape. It's very, very unfortunate that we as a community can come to some clear understanding of what we're dealing with here. And essentially what we're dealing with here is a horrible aspect of domestic abuse. Why we cannot understand that, understand that and act accordingly, providing the necessary um, uh, uh, laws to protect um, uh, spouses in those instances, I can't understand that. The, 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 um, but that's the reality we face. Uh, with regards to things like uh, safe environments, we live in an age now where it is important for us to actually be clear about the fact that we need to establish safe environment for the, environments for, for the protection of both minors and for the protection of vulnerable adults. This is one of the things we've learned from the history of the, uh, the, the you know, the horrific, horrific history of the so-called sexual abuse crisis that has faced the church globally. It's important for us to bear in mind that we have to respond and respond by creating safe environments, as I said, for minors and for vulnerable adults. And what's a vulnerable adult? A vulnerable adult is anybody involved in a, in a, in a relationship of unequal power. And I think it's important for us to keep in mind that we have to develop a culture of safety in those instances, whether it be in our parishes or in our schools, for example. There's a broader problem of, of migration here that's actually global. It affects virtually every nation in the world. We have, there are millions and millions of people on the move. They're leaving their homes of, of uh, the, 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 the country of origin and trying to find a country where they can somehow or other find a better life for themselves. This is happening all across the world. We see it all the time. It's happening particularly in our region and, and our country has been affected by it. We need to develop some solid uh, pol policy and program that actually addresses it. And we need, we need to do that, we've needed to do that for, for a very, very long time so that all the kinds of illegal sorts of uh, things that could be happening are not allowed to happen. I think it's important for us to look very, very carefully at the question of migration facing our country and as a nation to actually um, uh, deal with it in a more consistent uh, pattern than, we, than we've been doing in the past. I think certainly um, uh, protecting our borders and so on is one thing, but then there's a broader issue. The issue is if we do need certain, uh, the labor of certain migrants in our country, we should create legal pathways that allow them to come here, to be here legally, to be treated humanely, and to be processed and, and returned to their home of origin and so forth, having had some kind of beneficial experience here, both for the good of our country and for the good of themselves. But this goes back to the problem I raised earlier about family. You know, all those issues having to do with, with crime and so forth have related to the question of the quality of family life among us. We need to put a lot more emphasis on, on, the, on, on developing, sustaining, and, su and supporting family life. If we don't do that, we're going to continually have these issues. The question with regards to the crime is, really, what is, as it were, the incubator or the incubators of crime? Hmm? I believe uh, one of the starting point is the weakness in family life. Others could be the way in which we actually do or do not do enough to actually ensure that um, those who are most at risk as young men get the kinds of um, uh, formation and education they need to be uh, productive, uh, um, participating um, uh, members of our society. If we fail at those points, then those inc incubators of, cr of crime continue to exist, and the problem of crime continues to exist. The question of, of, of vaccination, the, 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 um, of course we were faced with a global pandemic, something we had not seen on our planet for about a century. And we had to really address that properly. And the question is, uh, well, how do we do that? Uh, we were assured by the proper authorities and the proper scientific authorities that uh, they, they had available a vaccine. 
And of course, there are many people who, who, who uh, were concerned about getting the vaccine. I myself happened not to be among them. I thought it was the right thing to do was to be vaccinated and to encourage other people to do so. I did go and get vaccinated. I had no issue with it whatsoever. And I'm very, very pleased to say that uh, um, I was able to really be spared any of the aspects of um, either the uh, reaction to the vaccine or to actually be infected by the um, uh, virus itself. So I'm happy that I did do it, and I would encourage anybody else to do the same thing, to be vaccinated. One of the things we have been speaking about in the church recently is a synodal church. That is the whole idea. Uh, of us marching together in faith, and I think or walking together in faith, accompanying one another in faith. And I think that uh, it's an, that's an aspect of understanding the full nature of the church. You all have a role to play in the church. Um, roles in the church are not just simply tied to those who happen to be formally ordained. But you all have a role to play. And I think that as we move forward in terms of trying to, uh, as it were, fill the gaps created by not having sufficient vocations, I think the laity, those uh, people of goodwill and good faith, can do a whole lot in terms of actually coming forward and uh, assisting in the actual task of evangelization, which is the mission of the church. When asked, as our first Bahamian Catholic bishop, what is most gratifying, challenging, and joyful to him, he shared these words. You know, um, as a bishop, as a bishop, I think uh, one of the things that's most gratifying is that you're actually able to very often do things that can make a difference in the lives of people. For example, um, most recently we saw in our response to Hurricane Dorian being able to rebuild schools, assist people in rebuilding homes, providing uh, the, the basic um, necessities uh, during the, the immediate aftermath, whether it's blankets, towels, uh, water or foodstuffs and so forth, being able to actually coordinate and provide for people at those very, very basic levels. I think that's one of the most gratifying things about being a bishop. Obviously, the role of bishop is much, much more than that. And I think um, one has to keep that in mind. One has to also exercise leadership in terms of teaching the faith, also in terms of leading people in prayer, all those aspects of it. But I think, uh, I suppose, at a kind of initial level, being able to actually do practical things and make, pe that, uh, make people's lives better, it's one of the most gratifying things about being a bishop. But I mean, there's always challenges. You know, the... the, uh, the uh, you always wish that um, the message you have to preach would reach more, well, more appreciative and welcome ears and hearts and so forth, but that will always be the case from now until eternity. I think the, the, uh, being able to simply celebrate the sacraments with people, like celebrating um, uh, as, a, as a parish priest celebrating uh, baptisms and so on, but now as a bishop celebrating confirmations and those things, I think those are very, very joyful occasions or celebrating, for example, like an ordination like we did not so long ago. One of the things you have to be, keep in mind is that you're always, you're always looking at the past from this moment uh, in history, and always, your, the, your first impression is, well, where did the time go? You know, uh, it, it seems like it, it is, um, uh, time has passed so rapidly, so quickly, you wonder where, the, where did the time go? But I look back and I see that the number of things that I've, I've been able to do, both here and abroad, and I think that um, you realize that the time that we've had has been the Lord's time, and we've tried to use it as well as we could to be pleasing in his eyes. I look to now, and I think it's important for us, um, if we actually take care of the present moment, that those 10 years will take care of themselves. That's most important. You know, uh, my, my goal is to ensure that with each passing day, we do all that we can to ensure that the gospel which we proclaim is proclaimed in its fullest sense. That's most important. Well, basically, my greatest, my greatest blessing is to have the humility to accept that responsibility and to do so in a spirit of service. Mm -hmm.